Hello, hello to all you folks from around the world. Welcome to the second day of OSDC 2021. And I hope you're all having a great, great time so far. I'm having a great time. It, I just finished all my sessions on APAC and now I am on EMEA. Okay, my name is Michael. I'm the Research and Development Director of Cloud Development Resources, and I'll be your host. Welcome to this session. Before we begin, for those who just joined, um, please post your questions on the Q&A section. Uh, you can locate it below the chat icon. Um, if time permits, our speaker will attend to your questions at the end of the session. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in. Out systems developers, me included, sometimes miss the importance of granularity and architecture in our applications. Why are these important and why should we address this concern? Our speaker for this session almost needs no introduction. He started as a programmer back in 2007 working with C and C++, very hardcore developer. One of his hobbies are hunting memory leaks while he finds joy in delivering value over flawless code. His eagerness to create shape and craft software from concept to code has made his mark in, in his creations. Here to share his passion in building frameworks and how to deliver the best possible developer experience and the only OutSystems MVP who could be a cast in the TV series Vikings, live from Russia, Ruben Gonçalves. Hi, Ruben. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Mike. Thank you so much for your kind words and funny introduction. Um, let me just actually do a small correction, which is I was neither a super hardcore developer in C++, okay. neither I was um, um, looking for memory leaks for oh. Bobby. Definitely. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. So now that we have cleared the floor of that, um, uh, let me see where Zoom is always. Let me start, share my screen. So welcome to this session. Uh, yesterday, possibly you have already seen my session, hopefully not, um, where I was trying to prove that uh, programming is actually a form of art while uh, being very shallow on examples as people actually told me. And that's actually fantastic feedback. Today, in this session, what I'll try to do is actually to take us at least knee deep into code um, so that you don't complain afterwards, uh, while trying to cover some of the principles that you should take in consideration when building a framework, a library, a component, anything. So first things first, um, you already know my name, you already know my looks from yesterday, from today. You already know a little bit about myself through Mike's eyes, but let me try also to tell you a little bit about myself through my own wise, uh, eyes. Um, so I've been working with OutSystems Platform since 2009, and I'm having the honor of actually becoming uh, not so long ago, maybe two years already quite long ago, uh, becoming uh, an OutSystems MVP. And I like to see myself as a code crafter, meaning not only work in, working in OutSystems specific technology, but working with code and with that being my, uh, being a, my craft. Um, other than this, I like to think of myself as curious, somehow venturesome and thinker. If you have questions, uh, I'll try to answer to them in the end of the session. If I don't get to answer to you, or if we don't have enough time, which I hope that we'll have, please feel free to send me or to reach me out to any of the contacts from that is more suitable for you so that I can uh, promptly move your message to spam and ignore it. This being said, um, what brings me here and why did I decide to uh, talk to you about this topic. Well, other than wanting to be one of the cool kids doing a presentation in OSDC, of course. During my experience working with OutSystems, I was, OutSystems platform, I was lucky enough to be part of the teams that created these frameworks, the Silky Y Web, and more recently, the OutSystems uh, DataGrid Reactive and the OutSystems Map. 
So in this session, I'll share with you some of the lessons that I learned with building them. By the way, if you today, if you haven't seen the talk by um, Bruno and Tiago from the data visualization team uh, entitled Storytelling with Data Visualization, make sure to check it out because other than being super cool and about kangaroos, is actually very showcasing on how you can display your data in a way that is easily understandable for the end users. But let's start with setting a common ground and of course your own expectations. So lowering your expectations is my purpose now. This is not a masterclass. The preparation of this talk was rather troubled because of the immense amount of things to talk about and the immense amount of things to consider and what was actually really relevant or not. But as this is not a masterclass, neither we have time to cover everything, you'll notice that some of the things will not be covered at all and other things will actually be a little bit oversimplified. Uh, but the idea is to get you some base, some starting point where actually continue understanding and evolving. So with this clear and with your expectations super low, um, let's try now to answer to the question that might be on your head because I've mean, been mentioning frameworks, libraries, components, but what do I mean uh, between uh, when I'm using the word framework or the word library? Let's first by start clearing this out. Frameworks and libraries, the core definition of them both is actually exactly the same. They, ref they basically are pieces of reliable, very important, reliable, reusable code that enables us to focus on the high level functionality of the application. And this definition applies to both, to frameworks and libraries. How they differ is actually in what's called control, in which libraries, the custom code invokes the library code, meaning the code that we are creating is invoking the library code. And on the framework side, it's the other way around, meaning the framework invokes our custom code. This is also known as the inversion of control. So what examples do we know of libraries and, frame and frameworks? I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar or have at least worked once with the obvious jQuery. Uh, well, it has been a long time possibly that if you are working with reactive applications that you have used it, hopefully. Uh, nevertheless, jQuery is a perfect example of a library. Another example now for frameworks. What frameworks came immediately to your mind? Well, there's an obvious one, React, right? It's the framework that our platform is using for the reactive web applications and the mobile applications. Then there are other examples such as uh, Flutter or Angular or Vue in terms of um, uh, frameworks. And in terms of libraries, we have, of course, TensorFlow, Wijimo library, FlexRead, or even Google Maps. But what we'll see in this session actually applies to both. Independently, if you are creating a framework from scratch or if you are uh, creating a library uh, and bottom line that in the out systems world, you are creating a component to be used by other developers, all of these principles apply. But now you might be asking, I came to this session to see what about this creating building frameworks. So how is this anyhow different from my day-to-day -day job? So in your everyday project, you are of course focused and concerned with achieving the business goals, with the features that you'll have to build in order to achieve that, with of course the timelines that are required by the business to achieve those exactly those goals by the performance of the application. Now that we are talking more uh, low code, uh, more on the code part, 
on the maintenance of the code that is highly, highly relevant, of course, because, I mean, you'll have to maintain it. So, and of course, in the user experience, how will the end users use the application and how they will feel using the application and how easy it will be to, for them to use the application. Now, if we compare to your everyday project to your framework project, how do they differ? Just like in your everyday project, framework also has goals, but also has exactly the things that we were talking uh, before. Features, timelines, performance, user experience, because bottom line, developers will be using the framework to build an end user application. So of course, you also need to be concerned with that. However, there are two other things that are highly relevant because besides user experience, you also have developer experience, which is your possibly main user that will use what you'll build to achieve their own goals. So the developer experience here is very, very important. And another thing is a little bit what I mean here with unknown ends, meaning you are building a framework, you have a notion of specific use cases and specific usages of that framework, but you will not be able to neither foresee, neither know in the end all of the ways that your code will be used by the different developers in their own projects. Besides, there's a very, very important thing, difference. You don't have a client. You, you have hundreds, thousands of customers, of cl clients, I'm so sorry, clients. And this is very important to have in mind when you are building a framework. Now that we have gone through a little bit uh, setting the expectations and setting the common ground, let's now see when you start forging a framework, a component, a library, what are the things that you need to be to have in consideration? Before there is a framework, there is just one thing, no framework. And uh, with that, there is also your own ability to listen. And don't confuse listen with hear, since the two things are very different. And listen is actually an act is actually an active process. So the first thing that you should do is to listen, and listen to the pains that developers are mentioning, are talking, the difficulties that they are facing, their objectives. And what are they really trying to achieve? What use cases can you find? By listening this, you will be able to frame the purpose for your framework. And this is highly, highly relevant because you cannot start building something if you don't know for what and to solve what you are building it. So as I first said, we first listen but we also listen all the time. And as we are going to see later on, this is highly, highly relevant because it's not just that you listen before you start building it, but you listen when you are building it, when you are releasing it, and when you are maintaining it, when you are evol evolving it, you are listening all of the time. And because this is an active process that you are constantly doing something very relevant to do, is when dealing with other developers is that you should acknowledge. Acknowledge that you are hearing them and follow up on anything that you heard. Meaning if someone tells you about a problem, a pain that you acknowledge, then that you solve, you should not only acknowledge them saying like, I hear you, I will register that. But then once you solve, you're like, hey, I heard, we heard you. We solved it, it's here in this, in this uh, version. And in the context of a framework, this is absolutely crucial for the success of the framework. Now, if you notice from the initial things that we mentioned on how a project, a framework project 
has or how is it different, we noticed that right in the listen part, we started covering here immediately some of the things. But it doesn't end here because you don't, cannot only listen, you then need to start designing upon what you listen. And uh, when you are designing, you are designing for others, not for yourself. And for designing for others, one of the first things that you need to do is actually to have a clear vision of where you actually want to, what you actually want to do and where you want to get to. And with the vision, there should be also clear core values that you are trying to feel, to follow in order to make your framework consistent and not only consistent, but according to your values of and to your vision. And not only that, because you are designing it for others, you also should think of it in a modular, in, in the granular way. And we are going to see in a little bit what exactly means to think of code in a modular way and in a granular way. By having this in mind when you are designing, you actually you are creating and you are setting yourself with a framework mindset. It's not longer um, a project, it's not necessarily a product, uh, but it's a framework mindset that you need to have. So because it's something that will be not just used by end users, but will be used by developers, by other developers to build something that many times you don't know what it is. And for achieving these goals, the first thing, or not the first thing, but a crucial thing that you need to do, one more crucial thing I know, is actually the choice of technology and tools that you'll be using. And you should choose definitely wisely because it's not, not because you know and you learn what's a hammer that everything around you will become nails. You should choose exactly the right technology and the right tools to solve the problem that you have at hand. And you can immediately see that once again, we are already covering some of the topics that uh, are relevant when you are building a framework in your framework project. But it's not only that, because we saw that it was a triangle. So the next is of course, create. When you finally start creating your framework, what are the things that are absolutely relevant and crucial for you to keep in mind all the time. First of all is architecture. The architecture will have a high impact on the future of framework, namely, and being a little bit egoistic on the maintenance of it. Because don't forget, many places and many times you build it, you maintain it. So the better architecture you create from the start, the easier it will be for you to evolve the easier it will be for you to fix problems, the easier it will be for you to um, create new features and actually make the framework even more successful by the release cadence that you can create with it. Of course, all of this is very pretty, but it's unfeasible if you actually don't have a testing, a strong um, testing planning. And finally, also extremely relevant right from the start when you are building and because you are building it for others. Don't forget samples. Samples are what will immediately help the developers to get off the ground and really use your framework in a successful way. So this is exactly when you are coding the framework. And things that also you should always have in consideration here, it's because your framework is going to be used by other developers, some more nerds, some other less nerds, but they will be used by developers. And you should also immediately start counting with how can you make it extensible? How can another developer take not only what you offer, but go beyond it and achieve his goal with the minimum possible pain for him? And I am a strongly, a strongly believer and the team that I was working with, the data visualization team, it's a strong believer also of open source because these two things, the extensibility and open source are actually make your framework future-proof as we are going to see. 
And in this phase, of course, you are concerned and you are approaching all of the things uh, that a framework is and that you should be considering during the framework build. But if there's one thing and one thing only that I would like to highlight or if I could highlight or not highlight enough, not talk enough about it, is actually the developer experience. And the reason for this is actually something that might be surprising for many of you, which is developers are people too. And I know that this might come to a shock for us as developers, many times not thinking that other developers are humans as well, but they are. And this means that they, just like any end user using your application, your project, it's not like they are stupid. It's not like they are not smart. Always consider that they have oh, way too many things to do. And your framework is just one more thing in their, um, in their day problems, in their things that they need to solve. So they don't have mind, neither to remember everything, neither to know everything about it. So every time now during this presentation that you'll see the, this gentleman looking at you very seriously or very pitily, uh, remember that this is actually related and this influences the developer experience. Enough of this. Now putting a little bit into practice and with a practical example. So as I was lucky enough, as I told you in the beginning, to be working on these components, um, I'm going to grab now on the data grid reactive component, and I'm going to drill down on each one of the things that we were discussing, that I was trying to present in you. So like I said, first, listen. So one of the things that we did as a team when we were to start working on the data grid for reactive is that we started by gathering information, such as, for example, forge download. As you know, there is a data grid for web, and we were to create a data grid for reactive. So we, of course, started to gather the information that we had immediately available. Four downloads is one of them, meaning how many downloads were of the data grid and how many were per version, meaning per things that were introduced, how many were the downloads, how many new downloads how many more new people are using it. And of course, we went to look to similar components that exist in the, in the Forge to understand what features do they have, what developer experience they offer, and how can this be done differently. But nevertheless, we were just collecting information in this phase. And also part of it was actually looking and reading and going through the users uh, and the posts put on the forums of our systems, and not only, uh, about the pains, the wish lists, the wish lists, the use cases, the objectives. But this is not enough, but this is the first step. We started by collecting information. The next step, of course, is actually really going and talking with people that actually use the, the previous component, meaning in this case, the data grid web, that they actually use and have an open and honest conversation with them about uh, understanding their complaints and getting insights of the usage, but also getting insights to the developers of what we are trying to do, of what the future can be. And not only that, but we also went to look for others. So let's not try to reinvent the wheel. Let's see what others are doing and see if they are doing better or what they are doing better so that we can try to bring it. And these are some of the competitors, not competitors of our systems, but competitors in terms of having a data grid that we went to see and to understand all that they are offering. Then, of course, design for others. And the first thing is for you to immediately start with a vision and with a motto of what we want to achieve, what you want to do. And this will really help you in making decisions along the way. 
So our vision and our motto was actually to, to make the data visualization so simple and effective as possible. And for making this and complementing this, we even created our values mantra, such as experience first, technology after. Although this sounds obvious, it's not so obvious. What we are telling here is that we want to offer the best possible experience to the developer. And the technology part on how we get there, we'll have to figure out, but that's not limiting. We shouldn't limit ourselves on the technology. We need to think the experience and fight for it as maximum as we can. Another one is the world is our customer. Meaning that like we said in the beginning, we don't have, when you are building a framework, you don't have one customer. You have dozens, hundreds, thousands of customers. So you cannot allow yourself to be ruled by the needs of a customer. You always need to incorporate the needs of, of a specific customer and incorporate with the, um, with the remaining uh, ecosystem, with the remaining needs of the other customers. And with that, understand what should be a priority to enter or not. And of course, not re reinvent the wheel. If someone already does something better, imagine data grid, there are many um, data grid libraries out there, AJ grid, Wijimo library that already make the, um, the end user experience very good. So why reinvent the wheel and create a library by ourselves when we can actually integrate a third party in this case, and with that already have the end user experience tackled and enabling us to be concerned with the developer experience. That is closely related with no one's left behind, always providing extensibility points, ways for the developers to achieve their goals with increasing amount of pain, depending on how further the goal that he wants to achieve is from uh, how we design the framework. And of course, no third party, no third party lock-in, meaning if we are using a provider, we shouldn't be locked to that provider and we should always make an abstraction layer for it so that with at any moment in time, we can replace it without any side effect for the developers. And uh, doing it right takes the same time as doing it wrong. This one is pretty obvious. And I think that it should be in our mentor has developers. And of course, keeping the feedback loop. This was something that we considered essential that we keep always hearing what people were what developers were needing, wanting, and their pains and goals. Then immediately starting thinking about in a modular and granular way right from the start. And that's, that means that in the case of a local platform has out systems, you need to know the platform. You need to know very well how to code in the platform because that will enable you, you will get, enable you to think, you will give you the tools to understand how to better divide your code. If it's a block, if it's a client side action or an action, a server side action, or if it's something that is achievable only by a JavaScript node. Nevertheless, this implies that you know the technology very, very well. And of course, the choice of the right technology. In this case, uh, we were integrated with a third party that was Wijimo. So we decided to choose TypeScript as our uh, base technology because it enables us to have, for example, compilation um, of the code and with that have immediately catch errors in compilation and compile time. And of course, of course, the OutSystems platform has the best way actually to create low code for the um, uh, low code for uh, developers. Uh, I mean, the developer experience, that's what I mean. That is the best way. And for that, by choosing the right technologies for what you are aiming to achieve, of course, you should also choose the appropriate tools. And that in our case meant using visual code has our development ID, obviously using GitHub has our code repository, then using Azure DevOps for automation and pipelines, as we are going to see in a moment. And of course, the Autism platform has ultimate 
tool for the developers to use our own framework that we're creating. Finally, when creating, in terms of architecture, it's immediately important to make it decoupled. And the first thing to make it decoupled from is, of course, from the provider that we were using. And for that, what, how we divided our code is that obviously we created a layer that uh, is provider specific code and interacts with the provider code. On top of which we created um, a layer that is um, logic and features that is a provider um, um, not specific. Um, this enable us to be decoupled from the provider. Along with that, we created then something that is not so common in the OutSystems projects, which is we created a static API and we are, called, we are talking here about JavaScript, okay? We created a static API that will be the one that will be invoked by the OutSystems platform. What this enables us to do is actually to have this area where changes occur more oftenly. And we are talking from logic and features all the way to the provider, leaving the static API has a static stable API. And with that also um, stable out systems code. This enabled us of course, to use the platform to work the maximum that we could, the developer experience, the low code developer experience that we can offer. And an example of that, is that uh, imagine a developer, when using an, a given action in the flow, he just drag and drops the client side action. And imagine in this case, it's filtered by value. This value, this action is one of the many APIs that, is, are, that are available in the data grid module. And this action inside, if you open the data grid, is a, basically just a JavaScript node that it's invoking that static API that I told you about in JavaScript. Meaning notice that it's just passing the parameters, has no logic on our system side. All of it is actually handled then on the JavaScript side, on the TypeScript side, okay? And this enables our code, our architecture to be decoupled from the provider, but also from out systems. So in the limit, our framework using all the way from the static API to below can be just used on a static uh, HTML page to create a data grid. And you can imagine, imagine see how this can be so useful for creating tests. Another thing was be um, the easy to extend. And thinking about that, we, we thought about six levels to extend um, the code. The first one is the obvious one, which is we have optional parameters in which one of the blocks that are not immediately visible, but they are there and that enable the developer to achieve different goals and different functionality um, just by using those properties that are not immediately visible, but they are still there. The second level is actually by using the events available on the blocks. And with that, doing extra logic on your side and enabling you to extend the behavior of a given block or, or in this case of the data grid. The third level is of course um, blocks. We created separate blocks with more events so that the original blocks, the blocks that are most commonly used and I'm talking about the grid, I'm talking about the columns that they are not overpopulated with events just, just a tiny portion of the people will use but instead we have a different block that enables them to tell, okay, I want to listen to this specific event on this grid and this enables them to continue extending to their code. And then the fourth way is that we created uh, 38 client side actions, uh, public made available so, so that developers can build their own code in a very, um, granular way. And this is exactly what I mean with granular, because the minimum action is so small that the developer can assemble his code to achieve a given goal. So it makes it not so client, it's not so much uh, customer specific 
or use case specific, but it's like a tiny piece that can be assembled in very many different ways. And then of course, the fifth way is when looking at our uh, TypeScript code that we have 81 static APIs that can be used. And that means that they can be invoked in the JavaScript node and very easily to be used for the purpose and for extending. So this is already fifth level. So if your use case cannot be done with in either of the previous levels, you can still get there by using our static APIs. If still this is not enough and you are still struggling with, your, with what you are trying to achieve, we created an even easier or another way that is in the limit, you can just obtain the code of the provider, the object of the provider, the instance, and with that, well, the world is yours. You can do anything that the provider allows you to do. In this case, that the Widgmo allows you to do. Another important thing about the architecture is easy to understand. And in local, the first part with the uh, given amount of blocks that are ready to be used with the um, input parameters and with the placeholders. And of course, with the events. And not only that, but also with the client side actions, very well uh, structured, very well divided. And when going to high code, we should apply the same things, which is, uh, as I was telling you, for example, our code is divided with, there's the folder for the grid API that has all of the code that will be invoked by the out systems code. Then we have the uh, OS framework that has logic and features that are provider independent. And with these, uh, we can change the lower part that is provider specific code at any time without impact for the upper layers. And of course, the provider library that we are importing in runtime. Also something that is highly relevant is the documentation. In this case, to help the, the developers to navigate, we created um, docs and the UML of our own code. Then we have, of course, testing that all of the things that are important, this is one of the most important and because it's so obvious uh, and so obvious important because a framework being used by hundreds of or thousands of projects, every single mistake, every bug can highly impact the end users, the developers, the companies that used it. And in the limit, of course, it will impact your own company and of course your own image and your own library because after all who wants to use a buggy framework and the buggy library component having this in consideration and as we all know testing is crucial and essential how we did it is since we are using github um, from the moment that when we are creating a feature we create a, a branch and there uh, when other features enter and when you finish your feature in the moment that you do a pull request actually um, uh, DevOps pipeline kicks in, the code is compiled, the code is then deployed to a specific application in our environment, and another pipeline running the tests will actually invoke the tests and run the live tests on that application. We have around 462 tests running in one browser, and we, when we are doing a release, we run in four browsers, but that means that from the moment that the pull request is done, 55 minutes later, we have the answer if the code that was inputted breaks or not the, the, the anyhow things are wrong. So that means that people that are doing code review immediately know what are, if there are consequences of that changes of that feature. And of course now samples, because samples is what helps the developer to understand. So we created a highly uh, complete uh, sample with all of the features and with the examples of what you can use and how you can use. As said before, being open source, uh, our code is in GitHub and it's a public GitHub, so you can actually go there and check it out. This enables people like, for example, Ricard Net here, uh, cannot thank him enough, that he came there, he saw a problem, he did a pull request, we analyzed it, we integrated, made they made minor changes and in the next release we of course gave kudos to those that help us to do this release with those with their contributions finally or better first listen all the time that means that when someone actually tells that found a problem or a feature that you don't 
support, first thing that you need to do is to acknowledge and tell the person that, yes, okay, now it's in our radar, now we are going to check it out and we'll let you know. And the fact of letting you know means exactly once the feature specifically that was requested by the person is released, you follow up and tell them, guys, it's here, check it out, test it out, give us more feedback, let us know if this solves your problem. Takeaway thoughts. You should first start by listening when you are creating, because only by listening, you know exactly what you are to do and to deliver. Then with what you listen, what you learn, you start putting it into paper, you start thinking about it, you start designing a solution and something that will solve it. And upon designing it, of course, you'll start creating. And with that, you come back to the beginning and you continue listening, listening all the time. And only by having these three together is that we can actually create magic. And remember, developers are people too, and they deserve great UX. Also, you make the blocks, but developers build the castle. And this, of course, as you might have understood, other than being oversimplified, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you are curious and interested, make sure to follow our systems blog on Medium, where our team, the data visualization team, is actually create, going to create multiple articles explaining each one of the things that we, I've explained you and uh, doing a deep dive on those things. Asisir, thank you for being here. And that's it. Back to you, Mike. All right. Thanks, Ruben. It's a tough, tough um, subject to, to present in a very, very short um, time. Um, I can feel you. Um, I myself and yeah, my voice I'm, is killed. Yep. Uh, I myself am building frameworks uh, for our company, for our developers. So um, Ruben is right. Um, your customer is not the client, but your customer are your developers if you're building frameworks. So anyway, we don't have um, much time for a lot of a lot of questions have popped up, but um, perhaps I'll just ask you the most uh, significant ones. Please are you ready? Are you ready, Ruben? <laughs> I was born ready for this. <laughs> All right. Let's go. All right. Okay. So um, uh, the first question is, um, can you share your experience on reaching developers for feedback? Which channels did you use? Uh, were developers available to help? Well, having consideration that we are building a component for being used by local developers, the obvious one was, of course, the, um, the forge, meaning by seeing the people that were uh, um, commenting, people that were requesting, that were complaining, we immediately have a list of people that are using it. And with that, um, immediately a list of people that were to contact. Ways to contact, we all did like Zoom calls, all call, like interviews by email, we did all of it. All right, all right. So it is it's like the same, like like an actual client project, right? Exactly, exactly. The process is the same. Okay, so uh, I think we'll have, we can accommodate a couple more questions. So uh, here's the next one. Is it possible to have automation test executed done in building frameworks? Yes, of course. Like I mentioned, uh, one of the advantages of the, um, of the um, architecture that we did is that since we decoupled completely the platform from the core of the framework, means that we can independently test the two things. Of course, if you are doing visual tests, you can use Selenium and on top of that test everything, like the functionality, but you can go all the way to unit tests by, use, by invoking simply the JavaScript API that we also have that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. All right. Because um, making framework is the same as it's, it's still a code. So the testing is the same way. So um, guys, we don't have time anymore. I'm so sorry. We cannot accommodate the other questions. Um, 
Ruben, thank you very much for this session. It's a tough, tough subject to discuss in, in just short time, but it's very meaningful. Um, um, and for the other guys there, um, we, we, I, hope, I hope Ruben inspires you to, to try to build frameworks uh, for your development teams. And um, thank you so much, Ruben. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoy the other sessions. Thank you. Bye. Bye.